Welcome to the third Friday uh, case conference, the treatment of substance use disorders and addiction during COVID-19. This is the ACMT and ASAM Addiction Toxicology Case Conference. I am Tim Wiegand, and joining me today is Dr. Glory Bishevitz. She is the Director of Strong Recovery and a Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the University of Rochester. We have a distinguished panelist group of panelists, Dr. Lewis Nelson, Chair of the Department of Emer Emergency Medicine at Rutgers Uni New University of New Jersey, Dr. Neil Seligman, who is a Director of, of Labor and Delivery at Strong Memorial Hospital and Associate Professor of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Dr. Jeffrey Seltzer, who is the Medical Director for the Committee of Physician Health, the Medical Society of the State of New York, and Dr. Norman Wetterow, Addiction Specialist, Tri-County Family Medicine, and on the NYSEAN Board of Directors. Uh, this, this webinar is available for AMA uh, CME credit uh, by completion of the questionnaire at the end of the webinar. There is no conflict of interest to disclose for any of our speakers, and I'm going to jump right in with the case, case one. Case one is an interesting uh, treat, uh, patient. It's a pregnant patient, a 31-year-old female with 30 weeks, and she's found unconscious behind an abandoned house. She has limited prenatal care and reportedly has been using substantial amounts of street Xanax, fentanyl, alcohol, and cocaine. Several recent overdoses, and she's been in the area EDs for and linked to treatment after. She's brought to the ED by critical care, brought to the ED critical care bay, lethargic, combative. Her skin is cool to the touch. Her hair and face are covered in vomit, and she has multiple bruises to her body. She's intubated for airway breathing and support but is waking up agitated and is requiring huge doses of sedatives. The intensivist and the obstetrician are asking for assistance managing her dependence withdrawal and sedation requirements after moving her to the ICU and determining that she has had not had premature rupture of membranes. And this is over the course of a couple of days. The patient has had two recent DD visits for overdose and was linked to addiction treatment after each. She is prescribed buprenorphine, but not taking, and you can look in the prescription monitoring program and see that she has current prescriptions. But she apparently just started in an opiate treatment program on methadone maintenance prior to this hospitalization, although there was really limited information about this available initially. She had intermittent OB contact, primarily when emergency services were needed. In the emergency department, antibiotics were started for aspiration pneumonia, and she was placed on a combination of sedatives and fentanyl for recurrent agitation while intubated. She required midazolam, ketamine, and fentanyl, bolus, and infusion to stabilize her after intubation. A recent ED visit for overdose identified benzodiazepines, opiates, cocaine, and fentanyl in her urine screen, and she's had numerous mixed opioid sedative overdoses going back six to seven years. Uh, she has been intermittently in opiate treatment programs or receiving buprenorphine and has had really limited compliance with both. It's now hospital day three, when the toxicology addiction service is consulted and she was requiring frequent midazolam and fentanyl boluses to control her agitation and she's not tolerating a pressure support weight trial due to agitation. The uh, fentanyl is ongoing at 175 micrograms per hour with frequent 100 microgram boluses and she's been continued on 30 milligrams of methadone enterally, which has been given that morning, still with persistent agitation and she's been monitored by, o by the OB team with fetal heart rate and movement monitoring as well. Information from her significant other suggests she's been binging with a combination of sedatives, stimulants, and opioids, and there's clear stigmata of IV drug use. He reports 10 milligrams of street Xanax, crack cocaine, both smoked and injected, alcohol, ice, and heroin or fentanyl. With increasing struggles in use since COVID-19 started, uh, she had limited program support. The virtual connection was very complicated for her. She had really been uh, uh, challenging in terms of access, accessing her support and care. Her significant, her significant other is upset. She's been with a pimp. The social history is quite complicated. The ISAP does show the current prescriptions for buprenorphine, and I have her urine drug screen from the initial presentation up on the screen, which shows the midazolam, which is given in the ED. It's metabolite, lorazepam, there's fentanyl, there's opiates, there's cocaine, there's benzodiazepines as well. So my questions for the panelists 
or what suggestions do you have at this point to stabilize this patient's symptoms and facilitate the sedation wean? I'll start with Dr. Nelson. What would you do to help stabilize this patient and participate in the sedation wean? So just so I go back, thanks, Tim, by the way, and, and thanks for having me on the conference. Um, the, um, just, I got maybe a little bit lost, but she's still intubated, is that right? Yes. And she's getting, it sounds like, a reasonable dose of a benzodiazepine and opioid and some oral opioids as well. Yes, she's on midazolam infusion at four milligrams per hour with frequent boluses of midazolam. Fentanyl at 175 micrograms per hour with frequent boluses of 100 micrograms and the interior methadone as well. And um, with any uh, touch uh, care treatment, she's very agitated and not tolerating pressure support at all. Right. I mean, I mean, it's, at some point you can only give so much medication. You could certainly go up on a few of these medications. I'm not sure how much of a benefit that's going to be given the degree of tolerance is going to have. I mean, one, one option would be to add another agent. Um, we could certainly think about something like dexmedetomidine or, you know, even for short-term use, ketamine, which would probably take the edge off. I think the question really would be about what's happening with her, her pregnancy status um, and what is the just kind of the short-term plan with that. Um, so I, I don't think there's a specific right answer, and I think it's not unreasonable to try to go a little bit more, but I would probably quickly try to switch to another age, just knowing that given the degree of tolerance she has, these probably won't suffice in the, um, in the short term. One of the things that we were particularly concerned with was benzodiazepine dependence and that the midazolam was just not sufficient. Uh, Dr. Seligman, could you comment at least on, you know, your first interaction with this case and um, questions or perception of what was going on? Well, thanks. Thanks for me as well, Tim, for including me. Um, I, I did participate in this patient's care for quite a while. Um, I think, you know, my concerns are a little bit different, and I defer a lot of the technical expertise to individuals like yourself on as far as managing the withdrawal. I think the things that I look at are considerations like making sure the mother is receiving standard of care treatment. When I look at a situation like this, I think of the baby, a, the baby as really the canary in the coal mine. And if there's something wrong with the baby, in many cases, it's because there's something wrong with the mother. And so we have to stabilize the mother first and make sure we're not withholding or altering treatment um, in most cases, specifically because of the fetus. Um, there are some minimal obstetric considerations like positioning in the bed to make sure that you avoid the long dorsal positioning, dorsal supine positioning in the third trimester, especially. Um, just so you're getting maximal blood return to the fetus. Um, this probably applies a little bit more towards uh, my thoughts about when she first arrived in the ED than somebody who's kind of stable on the ventilator in that decision about weaning. But the other interesting thing, and I, and I appreciate the other panelists' comment, is you, you do have to look at what's going on with the fetus and the short-term pregnancy plan because one of, the, one of the questions would be, why did she overdose? Um, why was she using in the way that she was using? Was this symptomatic of her use disorder or was this symptomatic of a pregnancy complication? These patients are particularly high risk for a number of pregnancy complications, preterm labor, preeclampsia, and don't often engage ideally in prenatal care. And so I would have raised the question about are we missing, was she medicating for painful contractions? Um, or some other pregnancy complication that's going to need to be addressed in this circumstance. The other thing that would be part of the conversation is, as we're addressing those complications, the medications that will be used uh, in situations where a baby may be born early and what the interactions are going to be with the medications that are um, being used for uh, the management of her withdrawal. The other thing is that the assessment of the fetus is, is really really challenging in these circumstances because you, you, you don't necessarily have a full picture from a um, sedated and intubated mother 
And meanwhile, we're loading her with medications that we know are affecting fetal status. And so you, you walk that, that fine line of trying to understand how healthy is this baby in its current situation when you're suppressing normal behavior with a lot of these medications that cross the placenta. Those are great Those are comments. And in particular, the uh, related to the benzodiazepine use, we, um, our standard treatment would be to use phenobarbital and load um, or stabilize at least withdrawal and then do a three-day titration. Um, as she was 30 weeks um, and there's initial concern for uh, premature rupture of membranes, we, we were a bit worried of dosing phenobarbital and then having not just the uh, phenobarbital, but opioids and um, effect um, post-delivery. But it became very clear that um, we really needed to stabilize the mother. Um, at some point, she was hypotensive as well, and so adding um, dexmedetomidine, the alpha-2 agonist, which would also be a normal adjunctive agent um, for, for this type of patient, was a concern. Um, Dr. Bashevitz, a um, few comments on when pregnancy and, and sedative dependence or when you have um, patients you're caring for and just simply in the opiate treatment program, maybe not that in the ICU. Uh, how do you manage your sedative dependence and what would you do um, in terms of managing wean or withdrawal? So, so assuming that the person is um, not, not in the hospital at all, uh, what we normally do in methadone maintenance is, uh, number one, try and avoid uh, uh, taking people on benzodiazepines in the first place, uh, try and get them to uh, decrease or stop their use if possible. Now, that's not always been possible with COVID and everything, uh, and people do uh, stop temporarily and then they restart. Uh, so uh, it, it is a difficult thing. Uh, but what we do is uh, try and uh, see if they have an underlying psychiatric disorder uh, uh, that um, would benefit from some other non uh, non benzo type of medication for starters. Um, that, that's one thing, and uh, we also reduce uh, their methadone dose usually on an outpatient basis. Um, so there's 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 a lot of options, uh, but uh, usually the patient is not real satisfied uh, with the options. The Treatment varies by state, certainly, but there had been some comments in the chart in this patient by um, a primary care physician related to um, implications after the pregnancy and what would happen with the um, baby and mother, um, potentially legal um, implications if she didn't uh, seek treatment. Um, Dr. Seligman, could you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, I think in this particular case, there was some speculation that her overdose may have been related to some misconceptions about the laws regarding substance use and pregnancy. Um, the charting had made reference to what it kind of, a, a um, I guess, could be interpreted as involuntary commitment um, during the pregnancy for substance use disorder with comments like, well, you know, we'll admit you for the duration of the pregnancy. And then even during her hospitalization uh, for the overdose, there was ongoing commentary about, um, well, I'm sure they won't, I'm sure the patient won't be discharged prior to uh, delivery of the baby. Um, and, you know, the, there's two sides to this. One is that the myth and misinformation surrounding substance use, various acts, a aspects of substance use in pregnancy, particularly the laws, um, is real. Uh, there's a lack of education out there uh, in, 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 in substance use disorder in general, uh, and um, certainly about the particular aspects that pertain to pregnancy. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of good resources out there like the Guttmacher Institute that kind of explains the various uh, implications of substance use disorder by state. Now, fortunately, we live in New York State and have you know, a state that does not criminalize substance use during pregnancy. And in fact, the laws that exist in New York State uh, are solely around the creation of dedicated treatment programs for pregnant women. So there is no reporting law. There is no uh, law that characterizes substance use as child abuse. And 
um, this is not grounds for removal of the child from the home or I guess eventual removal of the child from the home or involuntary commitment. So um, it's interesting to speculate whether that, that may have been a factor, um, but in fact was definitely not correct on the, on the part of that outside provider. All right, thank you. Um, and then at the third question on this slide is, what about the opioids in this intubated patient who is not tolerating, tolerating any degree of fentanyl wean? Um, uh, is Dr. Wetterow on the line? I don't see this as a panelist. Um, Dr. Wetterow? Dr. Uh, Seltzer, could you comment when a patient is on an opioid agonist and methadone or buprenorphine and is hospitalized, um, you know, with pain typically, what what would, um, if, if someone's reaching out to you for recommendations, what would your recommendations be regarding, you know, whether the methadone or buprenorphine should be continued or other opioids used? So I, uh, uh, standard of care would be that uh, the um, opioid being used for the treatment of opioid use disorder, I'm thinking that's the context you're talking about, Tim, uh, would just yeah, continue yeah. and that um, additional needs for uh, pain control would have to be addressed with different approaches, which may be uh, uh, additional um, uh, opioid medication use. I know some clinicians um, increase the dose of buprenorphine and find that effective. I, I think at some point you can reach ceilings, though, with uh, buprenorphine, and you may have to use um, uh, alternative opioid medications. Um, I, uh, in those contexts, I, um, in my own experience and the experience of other people, Certainly during an acute admission, I think uh, non-pharmacologic approaches really have limited value. But it always helps to um, be collaborative with a patient, to take their pain seriously, not dismiss it, and um, do, do the best you can. Thank you. We've been involved in a number of cases in which the there's misconception about whether the opioid agonist can be continued or that uh, since they're using other opioids, the, the uh, methadone or the buprenorphine really doesn't need to be there. And if a patient's on a very high dose of methadone, quite a lot of complications can result, uh, dehydration, delirium. And so this patient was on 30 milligrams of methadone. So she's getting the dose of methadone and fentanyl on top, but still quite agitated. Uh, so the, the patient uh, has a fentanyl and methadone continued, and uh, we really didn't feel like we were making any progress. And in patients um, like this, we've um, often tried to stabilize with buprenorphine, um, which seems to facilitate uh, the ventilator wean. There's less respiratory depression. She had just started the methadone. She had been on buprenorphine prior, um, so we had... Um, continued the methadone and continued the fentanyl and started with the buprenorphine microinduction uh, at the same time administering phenobarbital to try and titrate down the midazolam. Uh, the phenobarbital helped considerably um, after essentially an incremental load. Uh, she received a substantial amount of phenobarbital uh, but was able to wean off of the midazolam. Um, the buprenorphine microinduction is basically very, very small doses of buprenorphine placed sublingually uh, over a five-day period while the full agonists are continued. And you can see the microinduction process, 150 micrograms sublingually every six hours for four doses. And through this process, we were able to come down um, on day four, day five with the fentanyl and the methadone was, was able to be discontinued. We were able to start dexmedetomidine and the midazolam was uh, weaned off. And after reaching four sublingual uh, two, six hours of the buprenorphine, <laughs> the 
feedback. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, it's I want to mute their line. Thank you. Uh, we had seven days of challenging sedation wean and withdrawal management, um, but really as the microinduction completed and the phenobarbital had um, titration completed, uh, she was able to um, extubate. And uh, despite uh, trying to work with her for a couple of days on um, help stabilize and set up follow-up, um, getting psychiatry involved um, to um, confirm that she was not delirious and, and um, competent as um, the sedation wean progressed. She was a little bit confused, but her mental status improved greatly, and she was uh, cleared by psychiatry to, unfortunately, a very precarious social situation. Uh, she was referred to the area uh, opiate treatment program where she had just been started at prior to being, to being found um, unresponsive behind the um, house. Uh, so I want to uh, stop here. This slide, um, and by the way, these slides are available uh, both through the ACMT and ASAM website uh, the, the day following the case conference. Um, this slide uh, demonstrates really the microinduction process, um, which um, shows the full agonist being weaned during the microinduction protocol, which you don't necessarily have to do. The buprenorphine essentially trickles through the full agonist, replacing the full agonist at very small and slow rates, eliminating the precipitated withdrawal. Uh, this first was described as the Bernese method in an outpatient setting, but we've really found um, a lot of use for it in inpatient uh, units where uh, on high doses of opioids, uh, maybe involved in a trauma, um, aren't tolerating weans or sedation or really struggling with control of buprenorphine. Um, even sometimes then with the, the full agonist left on top of it can uh, help stabilize craving, dependence, and withdrawal, and often stabilizes the mood as well. So I want to have um, maybe Dr. Uh, Nelson, can you comment on the use of the, this uh, process? Have you seen this used? Um, what's your experience with um, the microinduction and thoughts on, you know, what uh, we did with the sedation wing here? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I've done this a number of times. Uh, and it, it's actually quite nice. And, you know, I'll just throw out the alternative is sometimes very large doses um, can sort of accomplish the same effect in a much shorter period of time. I guess my concerns and questions with this is it sounds like it took an additional seven days to get through this microinduction phase, but the patient probably still remained inadequately treated with fentanyl and, and, bupre and, and methadone. So this is a great thing, I think, to use. And again, you'll, you'll fill that in. But this is a great thing to use when you have a patient who's stable on methadone and you want to convert them over to buprenorphine. But it, it, if somebody's not stable on methadone, I think this is a um, probably a pretty treacherous way to, to manage people because even though it doesn't necessarily produce precipitated withdrawal, um, it doesn't manage the withdrawal that they're having very well. So if they're, you know, if they're undergoing, like this patient was, fentanyl and methadone, I don't know if it was withdrawal or inadequate sedation. There's got to be something to tie them over during that period of time. But but done done right in in small baby steps like you describe here, the conversion from methadone or or oxycodone long acting preps to buprenorphine works very well. I would say though that as, as I said at the beginning, we sometimes use sort of a a mega dose or a macro dose approach in a patient like this. Uh, not necessarily somebody who's 30 weeks pregnant, but <clears throat> where we give them, rather than try to either taper their methadone, like has historically been done, or microdose them, we just give them that very large, very large, <laughs> that very large dose initially, and they seem to, most people that we've done that with do seem to tolerate it pretty well. Just like we would if we gave them a smaller dose of buprenorphine and they started to withdraw, we'd give them a larger dose. We sort of just store with the large dose and been, we've been able to essentially convert people from methadone to buprenorphine in, in a day or two. So it, it's just an alternative approach. So you bring up two good points, and I want to clarify it. Once we realize that any um, titration or uh, sedation holiday attempts or weans were causing the agitation, we, she was left on the higher doses of fentanyl and the methadone continued. So basically, as this met, the microinduction uh, progressed, she was kept calm and relaxed. Okay. And that we. For the first three days of the um, uh, sedation were the complicated days with trying to get her pressure support and titrate on the fentanyl. The 
the next part of it was really the very simple process of doing the microinduction and letting the, the, the buprenorphine um, uh, sit at the receptor, accumulate at the receptors. Um, my experience with the large doses, just yesterday, uh, a gentleman tried to restart his uh, buprenorphine at 12 milligrams, 48 hours after taking um, his last dose of buprenorphine. He'd been on a holiday um, and using, um, uh, taking his last dose of fentanyl, excuse me, using he'd been off of his 12 milligrams of buprenorphine. He start, started at 12 milligrams and was the picture of horrible precipitated withdrawal. Um, and so those larger doses of buprenorphine, even when there's small doses of opioids, in my experience, really cause a lot of discomfort and um, pain. It would be interesting to compare, you know, clinically the response, but the bigger the dose, the closer to the full agonist, I, I see a lot of discomfort. Um, Dr. Bishevitz, um, what's your impression of precipitated withdrawal? Um, have you seen uh, more with the higher doses of buprenorphine or, um, you know, with, with lower doses? When you start now in the age of fentanyl in the, in the clinic here at Strong Recovery, are you starting with low or would you feel comfortable jumping to a high dose of buprenorphine very quickly? So usually we, we would give a uh, lower dose uh, just, just at first. The first dose uh, would be low, uh, such as two milligrams or four milligrams, but we might jump to a higher dose uh, if that seemed to barely touch the person. I have seen a lot of what Dr. Nelson uh, managed, uh, mentioned, though, um, in, in terms of needing to give a very high dose to uh, overcome some of these uh, precipitated withdrawal things. Oh, and I agree. Once you see the precipitated withdrawal, once it's it's started, giving more buprenorphine is is needed. Um, depending on the patient, um, I will sometimes give a large dose. I've also found that smaller doses, given very frequently, along with clonidine, can um, be as be effective as well if if they haven't fully precipitated the withdrawal. Um, it really depends on how much full agonist is left sitting at the receptor. So. Um, CPS is contacted while the patient is intubated prior to delivery. We've already kind of discussed um, this uh, a little bit re with regards to um, care of the mother and, and the status in New York. And I want to give Dr. Seligman uh, a few minutes to um, cover some of the topics that, that were particularly important in this case. Um, I, we have the entry slide. Um, Dr. Seligman, you tell me when to advance and um, Go ahead. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, you know, we, we've already talked a little bit about the importance of understanding the laws um, regarding reporting and substance abuse care, care regulations and local policies for contacting CPS. Um, I'll, I'll go back to that last question just for a second to say, um, I, I don't know in fact whether CPS was called, but because New York does not criminalize substance use during pregnancy, CPS would not take a referral for harm to the fetus based on the mother's substance use. The reason a, a call would be made to CPS would be if we felt her other children, and I don't think she did have any custody of her other children, but if we were concerned about custody of those other children, and or, or if we were concerned that she did have other children in her custody and any potential risk to them, that would have been the reason to make a prenatal uh, referral to CPS. Um, again, I, I can't stress enough, you know, we, we don't know for a fact how much the messaging to the patient was a part of her avoidance of care and her eventual overdose, um, but um, these, these are real possibilities. Um, ACOG is pretty clear about stating that they disagree with the criminalization of prenatal substance abuse and talk about various issues regarding um, risking the provider-patient relationship, re re deterring the patient from coming to get prenatal care, how these laws disproportionately affect black and brown women and low-income women, um, that it treats substance use as a moral failing rather than a medical condition, um, that lack of treatment on the part of the patient is not always due to refusal or lack of effort, but sometimes just lack of access. You want to advance? Um, this is, I think, um, 
I, I think today this question is pretty well answered, but I like to come back to it every once in a while just to make sure we understand the options on the table and why we're choosing one or the, over the other. And I, and I think um, the sl slide's probably today more aptly titled methadone versus buprenorphine versus buprenorphine naloxone. So I, I don't debate the value of buprenorphine when it comes to neonatal abstinence syndrome. I think the data is there. The mother study was pretty definitive. The meta-analyses have confirmed buprenorphine benefits the baby. That's that. Um, but that's not really the whole picture. And I think it's worth always reiterating the fact that the data also shows that on the flip side, that methadone is really more effective in treatment retention. Um, and there is this issue that I tread on lightly because I, I do totally understand that buprenorphine is harm reduction, but I also keep a very keen eye to outcomes when it comes to buprenorphine prescribed by the non-specialist, um, both because I do highly respect the um, knowledge of the specialist uh, addiction, the, of the addiction medicine specialist when it comes to um, best outcomes for these patients, as well as often the comprehensive nature of the programs that they're able to provide, which is not a requirement when a non-specialist is prescribing. Um, essentially, the letter of the law is that they have to have the ability to refer, but not the patient doesn't necessarily have to engage in services, and, and nor, nor do the services have to be on site. And I will come back to another comment on that as it pertains to updates from ASAM this year. Thinking about the balance here, so we have keeping the mom in treatment and the success of treatment, and then we have neonatal abstinence syndrome, I'd point out that we can expect NAS, we can treat NAS, and we don't really have any good data suggesting that NAS causes any long-term complications. So if the focus is avoiding relapse, which really is what is going to cause the real prenatal risks, then I would say the right drug for the mom is not always buprenorphine just because it's better for from an NAS perspective. It's going to be the drug that has the best treatment outcome, the drug that's going to prevent reuse of opioids best. Now, I did say, you know, buprenorphine, buprenorphine naloxone, so I think here's a good point of pointing out that at this point, probably the drug of choice is buprenorphine naloxone. Naloxone, we combine it with buprenorphine for purposes of preventing diversion. Um, can it be misused? You know, what is, are there the occasional patient who's going to inject the buprenorphine naloxone combination and potentially induce some withdrawal? Maybe, but I'm going to comment on, on withdrawal and what I think the real risk of withdrawal are. So if I have the mono product, that I, that I think is a concern for diversion versus the combined product with naloxone that really isn't orally absorbed, so it's not presenting any fetal risk, and the very small chance that they're going to misuse and inject it, and I don't think that's going to cause a risk, I'd rather go with the combination product. And I think society statements are starting to head that direction in agreement with the combination product. Advance? So I'll just make a brief statement that um, an old misconception was that we should limit the dose of methadone to benefit the baby. Um, I think that story is over. I think this has been clearly answered. I have some of my own published work on it, but I really uh, refer back to Brian Cleary's work that was published in 2010. Perhaps at the lowest doses under 40 milligrams, there may be a relation with lower doses being associated with lower risk of withdrawal, but honestly, um, the literature supports that for most addicted patients or most patients with a substance use disorder, that is going to be much lower than the therapeutic treatment doses that we're going to use on average, especially in pregnant women who often require higher doses. And the other thing I would point out, and this is in that graph on the bottom, is that I think there's a bit of, the mis a bit of misconception that as the mom's dose increases, we're exposing both mommy and the baby to more medication. And that's really not the case. What's happening is that because of inter individual variations in metabolism and because of the effects of the placenta, which also um, has an has effect on drug metabolism and drug transfer, in fact, what's happening is she's developing symptoms because her trough is going down. And as you increase the dose, you're correcting the trough. So ultimately, the drug she's seeing in the blood is really the same. 
Um, buprenorphine, same thing. There's really no, no relationship between buprenorphine dose and the risk of withdrawal advance. Um, old misconception about withdrawal. Now, the, the term withdrawal gets a little bit confusing because I think sometimes it's used for withdrawal symptoms. Other, other times it's being used to talk about a process of lowering the dose to minimize the mom's um, medication dose at delivery. Um, I put that picture in the top corner just to kind of be a visual reminder that I think for the patients, those, particularly those who are using um, heroin and, uh, and drugs of that nature, that withdrawal is probably part of everyday life. I think these patients frequently, due to lack of access to drug or varying potency of drug or contaminants in the drug, go through periods of higher and lower drug. We are basing all of our theoretic concern about withdrawal from two cases in the 70s, one where uh, amniotic fluid epinephrine went up when a woman was withdrawing and went down when they gave her more opioids. And so we said, ah, must be harmful. And one case where there was a single stillbirth. Now, fast forward 2020, Craig Towers has excellent data. He put together the results of 15 studies, and I'm just going to point out the, um, the risk of fetal demise, 1.2% in the detox group, 1.95% in the comparison group, higher in the comparison group. So I think that, in my mind, that's fairly definitive evidence that a patient experiencing withdrawal symptoms is not an imminent risk of fetal demise, assuming no major hemodynamic instability. On the other hand, do we take this data and then say we should be lowering the dose? Well, remember a slide back, I said, we're not, we don't really want to focus on withdrawal, we want to focus on recidivism. We know that it's not the most successful strategy in pregnancy. These patients often go back to using. So no, um, I, use it, I use it to dispel the myth that her withdrawal symptoms are harmful to the baby, but not to promote an agenda of um, anything other than maintenance during pregnancy. Um, forward. And then I'm just going to finish up with a few points that ASAM made this year. Um, the interesting, some minor interesting changes. Um, one is the medical and psychosocial assessment are recommended when evaluating women with opioid use disorder, but completion of the intake evaluation should not delay or preclude initiation of MAT. I think that's really important in terms of timely access to treatment. Um, this is another important point, and it's what I was making the comment about, about um, X waivers and buprenorphine by private providers, which is that the, that the we could debate this, um, and I don't think the time is there for a full discussion about it, but right now ACM is saying a woman's decision to decline psychosocial treatment or the absence of available treatment should not delay or preclude the initiation of MAT. Um, lack of screening, um, fear of the fetus by providers, lack of education, these are all factors that have um, been barriers to advancing treatment of pregnant women. Um, they talk a little bit about methadone dosing, though I think these are fairly standard approaches to methadone dosing. Um, the, there's a comment about now Trexone that there, the research is really insufficient. Uh, essentially, you could continue now Trexone during pregnancy, but it's rarely going to be a drug you're going to start during pregnancy. And um, I appreciate the comments of one of our other panelists um, who talked about the uh, treatment of acute pain and pointed out that we don't stop MAT uh, in order to better treat acute pain. We continue the MAT understanding that in most cases, um, the patient may just need a little bit more pure agonist. Um, that being said, I think there, we've successfully treated, it, treated at U of R several patients on buprenorphine solely by increasing their um, dose of buprenorphine and have had a few that have required between tap blocks at the time of cesarean section in increasing their buprenorphine dose in conjunction with, out, with their outpatient provider has successfully managed cesarean section patients with no adjuvant opioids. And I want to thank you, Tim, for allowing me to present these slides. Yes, thank you. That was great. Appreciate the comments. And um, you've also included your email for a question. Um, we could continue discussing that case for a long time, but I want to move on to uh, case two. Um, Dr. Wetterer, I'm going to unmute you right now so you you are joining us this is um, a case i will present and i have you comment on particular uh, factors uh, most of the questions are at the end this is a charismatic but challenging 18 year old gentleman he's actually uh, from a part of new york 
28 years old. Mm-hmm. 28 years old. I'm sorry. So the, the age I mistyped. 28 year old gentleman from a uh, rural part of New York with poly substance dependence, and he is in engaging in an outpatient treatment program and attempting to help to stabilize during COVID-19. Um, his background, he has a long history of alcohol, cocaine, and heroin dependence. He's struggling to maintain sobriety. He's incarcerated for violating probation in May of 2019. He's both been in inpatient and outpatient several times prior. Upon release, he's referred to treatment and requesting medication for opioid use disorder in a rural outpatient primary care clinic. A little reports rapid return to illicit benzodiazepines, heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine. He had started on buprenorphine, naloxone, 16 milligrams a day at the start at the outpatient program. He lives with his mother, who is semi involved with his care. Uh, do you have comments, Dr. Wetterall, for the background? No, and, and so we, we treated him in the outpatient, rural outpatient program, not primary care, this one. And um, the mother really was n- n- enabling. Okay. So, in 2019, his compliance was in question. Uh, he did have some buprenorphine in his urine, and uh, Dr. Wetter had provided the levels of the norbuprenorphine to creatinine, which for um, 15 milligrams are quite low. Uh, we've got one on 919 with 90s, and they're all uh, consistently positive with cocaine. In December 2019, he has a three day observed dose protocol where he's brought into the clinic and takes both the eight. At uh, the time in front of the provider, and there was dramatic rise in the in the levels. I didn't have the levels to show. You seven eighty on. It was it was so, seven eighty, and he just put off the, these. He's a very charming person. Uh, he really is, and uh, so we kept. You know, he had excuses, and we didn't do this until December. We couldn't get it done, and it was seven eighty. So clearly, he he was not taking all much of his medicine. I've, I've used the same protocol, a two-day, when, it, when somebody is very low and swears they're taking their entire dose, bring them in and um, do the observed dose. And even getting a urine later that afternoon shows dramatic increases. So it essentially 10 to 20-fold increases in his levels, confirming that he's not taking his 16 milligrams. Uh, he's really then struggling um, after that with alcohol, it seems, and benzodiazepines, cocaine, and again, low norbuprenorphine. Um, and you provided some options to him. If you can go over what your thoughts are in terms of uh, treatment options, since he's struggling and now added alcohol to the mix. Well, we wanted to give him supplicate and, and met right from almost from the beginning, and he absolutely refused. And, and we just struggled. I think a year, two years ago, we probably would have just dismissed him. But we, he's the chairman, and he said, "I'll do this and I'll do that." And so we continued him on. Uh, Methadone is an hour away in Rochester, so that's not real practical. That is certainly an option. It may end up an option before we all get done with this. Um, and uh, we wanted him to go to inpatient many times for alcohol and for everything. And so finally his mother said that she would uh, monitor that and, and, and hold it, and supposedly it was in a safe and locked up. Later on we found that that was not true at all. And uh, Oh, it was only true for a short while. So that's sort of where we were, and um, but the story goes on, and um, we, we didn't want to take him off. Mm-hmm. We, we choose his option four after refusing three uh, prior. Four is created in order to keep him engaged, and that was the buprenorphine um, injection, um, from what I understand. Um, so oh, uh, it was. We gave him. His mother gave it to him to keep him as engaged. He still took the oral until April. On March 11th, his cocaine is over 3,000. The alcohol metabolites are quite high with norbuprenorphine, creatinine in the 90s. He's uh, drinking because of anxiety related to COVID. He reports on the 23rd. He connects via telemedicine. Reports anxiety and drinking now half liter of vodka a day. And he, but his use and reports are unreliable um, as well as his um, connection. Uh, they seem to be increasing. Last screen showed the alcohol metabolites and cocaine with very low uh, metabolites. And um, on the 2nd of April, he contacts a provider asking to have help uh, with his drinking, so he refuses to go to detox or inpatient. So uh, um, what are the options for treating this patient with alcohol withdrawal in a rural setting, not willing to go to detox or inpatient? Would anyone attempt an ambulatory detox regimen? If so, how? Um, maybe Dr. Uh, Bishevitz, I'll have you comment, and then we can um, go back to Dr. Wetterow. 
Okay, so um, you, you would mainly want to uh, rule out history of uh, complicated withdrawal, uh, uh, maybe history of DTs or seizure or something like that. But if there's no history of that, there's no reason to avoid um, ambulatory uh, detox uh, as long as mom is uh, going to be controlling the medicine. And uh, like um, Dr. Wetterow said, that's not uh, necessarily been happening. So. Um, you have to make a judgment as to whether family is going to uh, going to be helping with that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, at least one time uh, it could be tried. He's in a family setting. He's not alone. Why not? I have been with some inventory withdrawal treatments and this one would make me uneasy with the mom being unreliable, the alcohol, the benzodiazepines. Um, adding another agent like gabapentin in the mix would seem to be you know, futile. So I would probably put my foot down at that in this. And Dr. Seltzer, have you been um, involved in any ambulatory withdrawal management uh, during COVID or seen the increase um, in use of that technique? Um, I, I, I have not directly been involved. I've uh, consulted with some people who have. I've done the um, uh, in, in my clinical life, a fair degree of um, uh, ambulatory alcohol detoxification. Um, I've uh, used Libram. Uh, I've used phenobarbital, which I think is um, has fallen undeservedly into uh, the view of uh, an obsolete drug. It's enormously useful. And um, I, there are some people I uh, have difficulty uh, uh, not worrying about uh, to the point of uh, having some nights without great sleep. But I'm also a big believer in calculating, so what's the alternative? And to leave somebody out of treatment isn't very satisfying. And I do my best to document that I've explained risks and benefits and that the person is competent to understand the risks of being uncooperative with the protocol. So like uh, Dr. Bashevitz, I'd give it a shot, I think. Those are great comments, in particular early in COVID without knowing how the hospital system would be impacted. Um, and depending on parts of the country, um, toleration for risk and more aggressive ambulatory protocols would be very uh, successful. And my perspective is that potentially by not by giving an ultimatum, there's been many times I've given an ultimatum, but then after it clearly isn't working, I've gone back and then agreed to um, do a treatment that um, was better than none at all. Um, Dr. Nelson, as one of the, um, the authors and the chair for the um, alcohol withdrawal guidelines for ASAM, do you have any comments on ambulatory um, detoxification? You know, I don't do this as part of my practice, but I, I guess I learned a little bit working on that project. But um, I would, I would personally be uncomfortable giving this person clodazepoxy or, or something that might have some significant synergism with any of the medications he's using. Um, you know, and, and carry some real consequences if he did drink and use it. It also, it just seems like dangerous drug for an outpatient use. I mean, clearly, I think I'm with you that I would rather see this person in an inpatient program. I don't think he's in a good social situation. His, his um, you know, family support mechanism doesn't sound very reliable, and he sort of sounds out of control a little bit. Um, I could see, although I don't know that the uh, effectiveness really um, holds enough muster at this point, but using a gabapentin carbamazepine type of approach to it and avoiding the benzodiazepine. Um, I mean, everybody has different risk tolerance for for these things, and and you know, again, it's not something I regularly do. But um, seeing it on the other side, on the inpatient side, I mean, it would make me uncomfortable to manage somebody like this as an outpatient. Yeah, the typical ambulatory withdrawal detox regimen that I use is gabapentin and valproic acid and maybe a dose of diazepam the first night with clonidine. And I found it works very well when you give them enough in the front and complement with valproate. 
the combination. We have discussed that previously in cases, so I won't get into that in detail. This patient is prescribed five milligrams isopam tab uh, for four doses. Um, and two days later, during a reports, he hasn't drank for two days. Uh, he refuses a prescription for disulfuram, uh, which I've had trouble getting for patients that are highly motivated because of a, a manufacturing um, uh, shortage. Uh, he thinks that he, he thinks he's going to drink. Um, no further diazepam prescribed. He denies his in withdrawal. But on the eighth, his mother calls in crisis. She caught him injecting his suboxone and confronts him. After which, she's caught stealing alcohol and arrested. Uh, he's released and contacts the clinic for follow prescriptions for buprenorphine. But is told his only option is a sublocate. He is irritable at first, but agrees, and the shot is ordered while maintaining him on 16 milligrams a day. And um, is given the first injection. Uh, tolerates. He's still drinking, um, but he feels fine with regards to opiates. Um, not doing urine screens due to COVID-19. Um, Dr. Water, maybe you can summarize the the end of this case and kind of how you worked with him um, and wh where he's at now. Okay. So let me and I want to say the alcohol detox. I gave him placebo. I wanted him to go to the hospitals an hour, um, a mile away. I talked to his mother. If he gets shaky, if he gets excited, I told him that, and he. Just take him to the emergency room. And I thought he might end up there. So I only gave him four Valium, which is like, just, I, I don't even know why I gave him that. But, and I was sort of mad at him. But um, anyway, he stopped drinking, but for a while. Um, so what happened? We gave him the sublocade, uh, and the third dose was 100 mil. In the meantime, he had an episode of pulling the knife on his mother and on the, um, uh, and then on threatening himself. He spent a week in the psych hospital. Mother wasn't going to take him home, but then took him home anyway. He didn't go to inpatient. I uh, was really pretty upset. Uh, and so then he um, go ahead. And he, uh, he The third dose of sublocade was 100, and he said he's in withdrawal. He felt terrible. Uh, and so I gave him two milligrams extra of oral suboxone for about a week, and he agreed to go to inpatient if we gave him another 300 milligrams of, of um, sublocade. Uh, we don't really know how he was doing in the subject. I think he was renting, well, he was still getting arrested for stealing alcohol. So he, so anyway, now uh, they didn't show up and he didn't go to inpatient. And so the questions that I really want you to help me on is do we, should we give him 300 again? Uh, we, we've ordered 100 and I think he'll come in for that. We haven't seen him for anything else. Um, when is it appropriate to keep giving the bigger dose? And um, then I mean, some of you might say we shouldn't be doing anything, send him to the methadone clinic, because he's just, uh, he's, you know, we're trying to ha reduce harm, but he threatened suicide, threatened his mother, he's drinking all the time, and we're not reduced, he's still alive. So I guess that's what I can say. Any help? <laughs> I can say I'm very impressed with your continuing to work with this gentleman, clearly um, struggling. And I think that, you know, the buprenorphine injections have really um, helped stabilize a lot of patients. Unfortunately, you know, the alcohol, it's not going to necessarily help. Uh, although I have found that when someone stabilizes in buprenorphine, alcohol consumption can sometimes then just kind of wane away. Um, I continue most patients on the 300 if they have any symptoms whatsoever on the 100. Um, most of the patients, and I have about 40 right now that I'm um, working with on sublocate, they have um, preference for the higher doses. Um, and don't like the 100 milligrams. There's only a handful that seem to that continue to stabilize, or ones that wanted to use it to wean off. Um, the legal system. There's so many questions, and I want to get to the third case. And so, um, I, the legal system has been less responsive to patients with substance use disorders and legal issues during the crisis with COVID-19. Drug court shutdown, hearings stalled, limited resources. And um, does anyone have any brief comments on how this has imp imp impacted their practice? Dr. Bishevitz? Um, well, I assume it's just slowed everything down, but no, no, I have not um, uh, seen any individual uh, examples of cases where that's uh, affected people a great deal, but I assume it's happening. Tim? Uh, Dr. I uh, just made a comment Dur during the surge of lease down state. Um, uh, so much of the hospital is repurposed for taking care of COVID intensive care that um, detox units were uh, curtailed or even closed. Again, speaking to at, at times the lack of options and that um, 
uh, you, uh, you may have no choice except to try and offer somebody what you think is a reasonable ambulatory plan. And, and, and I, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider norms uh, prescription of diazepam to be placebo. And um, um, uh, again, my preference for chlorodize, epoxide, or phenobarbital is I haven't found that it has a great abuse potential. And like Norm, I would really limit what is dispensed to a person. I usually don't. I usually use liber uh, other things. This is sort of an unusual case. <laughs> I usually get a little bit more and uh, you know, people call and we follow them up in the office and so on. But mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I think we'll be interested here. Hopefully, he stabilizes and comes back. I think you know a lot of uh, pieces that highlight challenges, not just during COVID, but um, in general care, uh, rural, um, and when resources are limited or when patients are challenging. Case three involves a pre-med psychonaut with opiate use disorder, and this is his self-described term. Psychonaut is an explorer of psychotherapeutics and consciousness. He's 30, pre-med, and, and um, self-refers to an outpatient clinic to start buprenorphine because his opioid use is getting out of hand. Uh, he, um, on the initial telephone interview, he reports use of both prescription opioids and a synthetic opioid he's ordering online, the dark web, orthodesmethyltramadol. Uh, first introduced opioids when my, his lung collapsed uh, at age 12, then started abusing them at age 15, prescription opioids, friends, parents, med cabinet, started drinking at age 15, his use progressed to five bigs of heroin or 200 morphine equivalents, and he, these are his terms of prescription opioids. Last year's heroin was the week prior, and um, that's really what um, made him concerned, is escalating use. Uh, this morning of the call, he's used 150 milligram tab of codeine, his use is interfering with school and his social life, some craving, tolerance, withdrawal, if he doesn't use opioids. He also reports illicit buprenorphine naloxone, and he would like to start it appropriately. Other substances are currently THC, can daily to, for stress, anxiety, pain, and migraines. Uh, he referred to the provider uh, within 24 hours of the phone interview, and uh, as he wants to start the buprenorphine. His past history is fibromyalgia, migraines, low testosterone, and the pneumothorax. His medications are Mgaldi is migraine med, quetiapine at night, amphetamines, five milligrams PRN, uh, lipidex amphetamine, 50 milligrams, Fioracet intermittently, pregabalin, 75 milligrams, two PLTID, so, so 270 tabs a month or capsules a month, aclonidine, 0.2 at night, hydroxazine, 50 milligrams, one to two, TID and an SNRI that um, he couldn't recall. So he's interviewed by phone and he states he's ready to do the induction. After reviewing the med list and learning, learning he's taking these numerous controlled substances, he, I bring him in the following day to check and obtain a urine screen to do an observed dose. He's very knowledgeable about psychoactive meds and drugs, including various synthetic designer drugs. In the past, he's ordered this synthetic opioids and um, gone through the dark web uh, last one to two months prior, denied stimulant abuse or sedative abuse, prior episodes of counseling, no history of regular medication-assisted treatment, Increased to consent with his prescribers, lives with his male partner, he's pre-med, former tobacco, uh, he has parents in the area, he has several other providers, his urine dip comes back, amphetamines, buc, barbiturates, and THC. And I just want to show you that his prescription monitoring program, which is one year's worth in New York, had over 100 entries related to uh, amphetamine, uh, listex amphetamine, the pregabalin, uh, different doses of carsoprodol, uh, diazepam, fioracet, uh, some opioids intermittently. Uh, so my questions are, what do you do, and is it appropriate for buprenorphine induction? Uh, thoughts on his other medications? And in particular, um, he's pre-med. What are the resources for healthcare, um, not necessarily uh, the providers are full, physicians, but residents, uh, uh, fellows, or med students, or pre-med students, Dr. Seltzer, is there any in particular that, in addition to the standard treatment, that he could access? Well, um, so Tim, I have to confess, I, um, I thought we were going to stop around two, um, so um, I'm kind of hemmed in. Um, I, I think, um, 
uh, what you want me to comment on is uh, what might be available for a medical student in the way of physician health programs or a pre-medical student. Am I, am I right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, just one comment. I'm not sure if the drug screen also looked at his current alcohol use, but um, it uh, uh, be a component that I think would uh, be important. Um, so physician health programs uh, vary state by state. I'm the medical director of the uh, physician health program in New York State Committee for Physician Health. We routinely work with medical students and we're happy to get referrals of um, medical students. Uh, this guy identifies as being pre-medical. Um, I, perhaps you know where he actually is in formal pre-medical education. Um, I, I had wondered if his own experience in ordering online and his own knowledge uh, uh, sort of persuaded him that he may have had a, he may already have a pre-medical uh, credential. Um, we don't work with people before they enter into medical school. Uh, saying that we don't work with them means that we wouldn't formally um, have them enter our program as a participant, but uh, we would try and connect to anyone who contacts us with help and have an interest in them and um, focus on their health as really being an important uh, uh, prerequisite to uh, uh, entering medical school, given the stress of medical school. Uh, we routinely work with medical students and um, uh, they're uh, formally within our charter. Um, we don't have reporting responsibilities to uh, anyone external to us within the state uh, for uh, medical students, uh, regardless of how they perform. Uh, in general, with permission, we report back to the school. And um, I think uh, one of the potential benefits of a medical student participating with us is we can continue to uh, provide support and guidance as they make a transition out of uh, medical school into residency, which is a completely new set of stresses. Um, unfortunately, some of the medical schools, um, when there's a troubled student, um, don't address it so much as um, hope that the residency will address it. Similarly, residencies may uh, hope that the uh, next professional phase will address problems with substance use. And um, if someone becomes a participant with us, uh, we'll help out wherever they are uh, in their life cycle. Um, and, and again, should a pre-medical student contact us, we try and be as helpful as we can. But uh, within our um, charter, um, which has implications, implications because we get our funding through the state, um, we aren't permitted to enter pre-medical students as formal participants. Thank you for the comments, and I appreciate if you have to step off. Um, we are just going a few minutes over, but um, this gentleman was in his second year, and I think he really fa fashioned himself as his own physician. He had in, he interest in nootropics, um, and there was no epiglucuronic sulfate. I did scroll through his urine screen. He, he did have buprenorphine metabolites in his urine, the, the butalbital from Bioreset, the THC and amphetamines were the things that were positive. Uh, the patient's results return, um, and um, I hadn't actually realized that he was on pure set. And he said, and um, looking at the eye stop, the PMP, I don't, didn't see a recent prescription. And he says, oh, it's from Fiorinol, the one that doesn't come up. Um, he says, it's not the controlled one. I just picked up a prescription for that. He reports migraines and fibromyalgia are causing him chronic pain, and the pregabalin helps, but I'll go down to 50 milligrams. And when I initially reviewed it, I'd interpreted the 270 caps as a three-month supply, not a one-month, and that he was taking 75 TID instead of three times 75 TID. And he say, says, well, no, I'm not actually doing that. I'm taking 100 milligrams three times a day, which was a prescription from about six months ago. 
when asked where he's getting the 100 milligram caps, he says, well, those are the old 50 milligram caps. Um, he's still picking up the 75 milligram caps. And I asked, well, where is it? He says, it's still at home. And I said, it must have thousands of caps at home. And he's confirmed he does. Insurance covers it. Why wouldn't I pick it up? It's not like it gets, it gets me high or I'm abusing it. Um, that was his comment. I expressed some concern and um, really tried to engage him in his interest in pharmacology, which I think, you know, his realizing that he knew what or death methyl tramadol was and the dark web made him interested. And I thought I would be able to work with some of his providers um, and let them know. So he um, was prescribed buprenorphine, the four, one, twice a day, um, no craving or fatigue. He does have some sweating. He says, I know all opiates cause some sweating and some periods of anxiety, and um, he calls the next day wondering about the dose. I contacted his neurologist, who was horrified that Fioracet and Fioranol were prescribed. The, the quote was, that is a four-letter word around here, the, the Fioracet and Fioranol. Uh, she's perplexed by his pregabalin. He has reported that he has large amounts, when, re, when reported that he has large amounts stockpiled. Uh, she feels that since starting them Galdi, the migraines have dramatically improved, and he really shouldn't even need the Lyric anymore, pregabalin anymore. Um, his neurologist is going to call or bring in to address and I'm following up with other providers, trying to track down where the Fiorinol is picked up. And after, later that week, his, I think he was called by his neurologist. He unfortunately had called back uh, to change providers to another provider in their community who seems very, very, very liberal with um, co-prescription of all sorts of medications. And so I'm really concerned. Um, there was consent to send over a treatment note, so we'll express concern in a letter. Um, so my question is, uh, are there any other obligations to follow up outside of standard patient care agreement confidentiality? Um, after, uh, I don't think he's revoked the consent, so I'd have to go back and look. After he's leaving or in the process of leaving the program, would it be appropriate to contact his other prescribers, his psychiatrist, to let him know about the um, uh, other medications, his use, stockpile, and things like that. And Dr. Seltzer already had answered the final question at students. Does anyone have any particular comments regarding um, their work with a patient like this, what you would do? Dr. Bishevitz? Well, um, Tim, as you were uh, narrating this, I wondered uh, exactly how much of the information was true anyway, because it sounds, uh, you know, a guy like this often um, makes up stuff and, and he might uh, be telling you only a very small part of the actual truth here. Uh, so I, I, I just don't know um, the answers to everything, but uh, I think the stockpiling question is very interesting. I assume that many people stockpile. This guy is just telling you about it. And I don't know that you have any particular obligations right now unless unless you know maybe that he's suicidal, maybe he has a psychiatric history of um, having been in the hospital numerous times for suicidal uh, attempts, uh, but we don't know that. You, you didn't say that, and uh, um, maybe that's not the case. Um, I think that um, his other providers should be checking I stop uh, the prescription management program as well. Uh, when they get this case, and they will they will see that he's uh, you know uh, what he's getting. They'll see what you saw um, in addition to uh, seeing the Suboxone uh, that that is going to be prescribed by the local MAT person. Uh, so I, I'm not sure you have a particular obligation there either. Um, I, I do think one good possibility. You know, you, you mentioned also all the medications he's on, he's on a lot of uh, medications, and you wonder uh, what, which ones you can peel away and which not. Uh, I think it would be very helpful to talk to the psychiatrist, and sometimes, um, I, I know you tried, it says that you tried to do that, uh, but there's no return call, um, and uh, I, th I think sometimes it's helpful to uh, just insist on that before prescribing the buprenorphine. <laughs> Right, I think, and he had agreed to consents as well. I, you know, the the same prescribers had been continuously prescribing throughout the years. So I have to assume that they were checking the eye stop as it's mandatory, and seeing that there was literally over 120 entries. He was also on testosterone. His um his urine screen did reflect what he was taking. The butalbital was there. The pregabalin we actually checked. 
um, as well as amphetamine and THC. So um, I di didn't see, um, you know, other opioids, and so I do believe that he was taking, you know, much of what he's taking. I I agree with, I'm worried about some of his meds. I think the side effects and the benefits are just are counteracting maybe some of the meds he's taking during the day. I get worried about quetiapine for sleep outside of a delirious patient in the hospital or what someone with a you know, severe mood disorder or schizophrenia for an otherwise healthy uh, patient in particular with substance use disorder. It's just kind of added into the mix um, for sleep. Uh, Dr. Wetterow, did you have any other comments? Um, yep. and, and, go ahead. Yeah, I think that, um... The other part of this is whether the psychiatrist or gets a counselor or someone that can connect with him. I've had a number of college students uh, and, and that he's pre-med. I don't know what his grades are, but um, you know, trying to motivate him. How, how does he feel about what he's doing? How, what does he think about the medicine? You know a lot about medicine. What do you know about addiction? Uh, maybe you could take a course uh, and see if he, you can transform him into being concerned about these drugs. Uh, Putting it, some of it in his lap. What do you think? Uh, and it, part of it depends how his grades are. I just I find it hard to believe that he is, you know, getting a four point average and doing wonderful with all these things. And so if he, we can create a little doubt in his mind that maybe uh, life is not so good that he needs to consider some other alternative. He may get mad at the doctors prescribing. He may see somebody else, and I, I've certainly seen that. And then you, the patient, really, and you are a partner in terms in terms of changing things around. So that would be, um, you know, in addition to changing the meds, so he's not fighting you all the time or searching. He has to come to realize that he doesn't really want to be on all these meds and it's not helping him. So that's, that's my two cents worth. So those are great and ex excellent techniques. I tried at the first call with the quetiapine, just kind of briefly commenting on, you know, how for sleep I've seen more side effects, the weight gain, the uh, neurologic effects, cardiac QT, and and he very was kind of brushed that off as it, it was a low dose, and um, he was aware of the weight gain. He hadn't felt it, and but um, yeah, I'm certainly trying to engage him as, as a partner and and um, kind of passive motivational interviewing and you know establishing a a, a bond. We're trying to do that. Um, I just want to comment a little. On O-desmethyl tramadol, um, it's a metabolite of tramadol. Uh, tramadol to O-desmethyl tramadol occurs via P452D6. This is essentially the same reaction uh, that um, occurs coding to morphine is via 2D6. So there's genetic variability in how much uh, 2D6 is in a population. Um, coding, no mu effect, it turns into a very strong opioid morphine in a variable amount across the population. So we don't use coding essentially very much anymore because um, when you want it, when you have an opioid, you want to know the dose you're getting. Uh, tramadol, sometimes considered the non-opioid opioid, the unabusable opioid uh, is on my top 10 list of least favorite medications, pretty close to number one, if not number one, uh, interaction, um, lack of efficacy, uh, abuse potential over in one study of uh, patients that had non-medical use of tramadol following for three years, over 50% had seizures at one point or another. Um, seizures occur uh, with uh, tramadol overdoses. Uh, reversal with naloxone can cause uh, seizure. Um, Desmethyl tramadol is sometimes an adulterant. Um, there's been a product called uh, Krypton. This is a, a Kratom product that was sold in Ireland, I believe, in particular, and across Europe, and large amounts of death methyl tramadol adulterated into Krypton. Uh, Kratom caused a uh, number of overdoses, fatal overdoses. Um, I still available. Um, the screen prior showed uh, one of the websites that it was for sale, and here you see a uh, schema of tramadol metabolism. So in postmortem uh, toxicology, where tramadol overdoses or tramadol is involved at levels of desmethyl will be particularly important in trying to interpret um, the uh, um, role of tramadol or cause of death. Uh, that's it for the cases. Uh, in the last couple of uh, presentations, I've ended with a poem um, from Raymond Carver, and I wanted to include a brief poem. Uh, this one is called Drinking While Driving, Raymond Carver. Uh, uh, the uh, Chekhov 
of America, sometimes called the checkup of America. So this is drinking while driving. It's August and I have not read a book in six months, except something called The Retreat from Moscow by Colin Court. Nevertheless, I'm happy riding in a car with my brother and drinking from a pint of Old Crow. We do not have any place in mind to go. We're just driving. If I closed my eyes for a minute, I would be lost. Yet I could gladly lie down and sleep forever beside the road. My brother nudges me. Any minute now, something will happen. A little bit about Raymond Carver. Uh, he um, was uh, struggling with alcohol use disorder, became sober. Um, as he became sober, met to the love of his life and wrote some of his most famous work and um, unfortunately died from lung cancer um, to, to the brain um, from years of smoking. Uh, his poem, Gravy, which we included in one of the press sessions, just his experience and gratitude. So we're not going to have time for questions and answers. This, these um, webinars are recorded and CME credit is available upon completion uh, for physicians and advanced providers of the um, questions at the end or through the ASAM um, uh, web website. Uh, mark your calendars for the next Itchin Toxicology Case Conference. We're moving to Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. On September 4th, we'll have guest Dr. Barry Logan, Chief Scientist, NMS Labs, joining us uh, is with the additional panel focused on designer drugs and forensic lab testing in cases, again, during the time of COVID. Um, and then October 2nd, November 6th. And I want to thank our panelists and in particular, uh, Neil Seligman for joining us to um, uh, help uh, discuss case one. Uh, thank you all for attending. And that concludes our ACMT and ASAM Addiction Toxicology Case Conference. Have a great everyone.